And because he decided to tempt me, he decided to tempt fate, this one's for Dave. Uh, <clears throat> uh, kept you waiting, huh? There we go, boys. <laughs> Just like, there's that beautiful voice. Oh, uh, you should have heard me last week where I sounded like a mixture of Fran Drescher and like the green fat kid from Regular Show. <laughs> like, it was, I was disgusting. Uh, despite everything, your mic is indeed picking up. And here we are. This is it. We are well over a year late. Actually, wait, I think we're like, um, we're like 11 months late. Because I think it was supposed to do in August for the August release date, and then pfft, that fell apart. But here we are. This is Silent Hill 3 in depth. This is going to be a definitely two, most likely three day live stream event where we're going to play Silent Hill 3 start to finish. If you haven't seen any of my past work with the Silent Hill games so far, uh, basically the gist of what we're going to do here is we're uh, going to play the game start to finish and I will discuss the plot, lore, characters, symbolism, and my own personal readings and takes on things as we go. If you're a longtime viewer, you know the drill and... For, on time, the 20th anniversaries of Silent Hill 1 and 2, we did successfully do that. The thing I will say that might turn off newer viewers is we're going to be doing this expanding on ideas from Silent Hill 1 and 2 in depth. I'll definitely summarize them and go over them quickly here to catch anyone up to speed, because like I'm not going to expect you to watch like two 10-hour series before this. However... It is recommended if you want the full doomed lore dump experience. Now, uh, are you going to turn off the noise filter and the options? I will not. We are going to do this mostly as intended. Now, obviously, um, Reaver Jill Sandwiches said this is the classic PS2 version. This is not. This is an emulation. Uh, this is an emulation on my currently dying PC, but I'm pretty sure this can handle one more ride. This is going to be this old girl's last hurrah, I feel. But if it can last, we'll be good. So... Okay. I want Doom to dump all over me. <laughs> I just rub my hands together. Now, as we have done in years past, we will only discuss events in the plot as they are brought up during gameplay. So we're going to discuss events, concepts, story beats, and spoilers as they are presented to the audience. We're going to try our level best to present this as if you had not played Silent Hill 3 or had any any knowledge of it whatsoever. Now, chat will be able to spoil whatever chat wants. That's on them. I'll try my best to avoid reading any specific spoilers out loud, but that's just going to be a part of it. I'm not going to regulate anyone wanting to talk about future reveals and anything like that. Uh, emulated Silent Hill 3 uh, has issues with cutscenes like with Silent Hill 2. Yeah. Yeah, I do. it does have those issues. Now, actually, the one thing I will say about the emulation of Silent Hill 3 that's better than 2's... Well, Silent Hill 2's actual in-game rendering is stronger. The cutscenes of this are all in-engine. Where Silent Hill 2's are pre-rendered. And the pre-rendering was actually the issue of emulating Silent Hill 2. As we had to save state and figure out as we went. Uh, Emulate Silent Hill 3 worked okay for me. I pretty, I am 99% confident it's my PC. Like, this thing's absolutely on its last legs. So, that sucks. But, what can you do? Now, we're going to be using primary sources of information here for, uh, when we're discussing like lore and plot and storytelling of the actual text itself. So we're going to be using developer interviews, the making of Silent Hill 3 documentary, and most heavily, the Book of Lost Memories. So those will be our primary sources of 
uh, sort of like canon information, but as we'll go over, even in the official canon information and discussion from Team Silent in, say, the Book of Lost Memories, I'm confident, I'd have to reread uh, passages of it, but I'm confident the director of this game, and, no, the writer of this game, Hiroyuki Owaku himself says, we left things open to interpretation. So there's obviously going to be some gap fill in here. We're going to be avoiding the Silent Hill wiki, obviously, for some foreskin-related reasons. And, as always, when I'm doing my own out-of-my-ass personal speculation, I will preface that. Uh, I'll make sure not to spoil the part where Heather gets a magical bow and arrow and fight historical serial killers. No, wait, that's Clock Tower 3. God, Clock Tower 3 is insane. It's so weird, because, like, Clock Tower 3 is, like, technically the best Clock Tower game. <laughs> Wikis are not 100% actually, yeah, like, no, nah, we're, we're not going to be using the Sound Hill 3 wiki for this. I'll discuss one reason why in a point that I'm going to steal. Nothing wrong with a little skin on the tip. Hey, I got my foreskin. Uh, I'm part of the foreskin hood club. Uh, I don't know why I said that, but I'm part of it, baby. Hell yeah. Foreskin for life. Uh, okay, so let's ignore I just said that. Um... <laughs> okay, that is not... Yeah, wikis are not 100% accurate. Um, in a bit, I'm going to steal from one of the primary influences for Sound Hill 3 In-Depth, um, Aesir Aesthetic's commentary of Sound Hill 3. He points out one of the most ridiculous examples of speculation from the wiki about an enemy design in this game. And we'll touch on that. But speaking of inspirations for the project... Uh, the old line figure Let's Play channel on YouTube, the Silent Pyramid Plot Guide from GameFAQs, written in about 2006, 2007, I believe. Uh, the YouTube channels Ragnarok, Eurothug, and Aesir Aesthetics. All of those are heavily influencing my work here. And when I'm talking about certain topics, I will be referencing a few uh, academic journal articles. Specifically one where we're going to talk about uh, the, probably the closest thing to a pure definition of a certain genre of horror. I think that's it, actually. So without further ado, let's get into it. Only the Sound Hill 4 wiki is the one to follow. 100% accurate. Not up for debate. I would love to sit down one-on-one -on -one with that one admin on Sound Hill 4 and Xenogears, who just went insane about, like, foreskin and the American trauma of circumcision. Like, I would love to just pick that guy's mind for, like, an hour. But without further ado... And that is our opening. 
So, uh, let's quickly touch on that opening sequence. As you can tell, it is very art house, very visually provocative. But what does it really mean? Well, unfortunately, it's one of those kind of things, and I'm going to be saying this a lot tonight. We are not we are not going to be able to fully get into a lot of the symbolism until the second half of the game. A lot of Silent Hill 3 has this very strange pacing issue of... There is a very big reveal in the middle section of the game, and that's when all, everything beforehand you can start to really dive into conceptually. It's one of the bigger issues I do have with the game's pacing, not for the game itself, just for how I present these live streams. It's not a problem, it just sucks for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, for today it's going to be a lot of... Mental bookmark that we're going to talk about that either at the end of the night or beginning of tomorrow. So, say la vie. But, opening sequence, what does that mean? So, it is a top-down view of a teacup ride that you probably see in, like, amusement parks like Disneyland and such all the time. But what you're seeing is three spinning teacups. Uh, they're all spinning in a circle in the same direction, counterclockwise. However, the three circles spinning counterclockwise are placed on top of a fourth circle spinning clockwise. So, without getting too much into spoilers, as we've lightly touched on, especially in Silent Hill 2, but also in the first game, cycles, cyclic behavior, and loops are pretty much the forefront of Silent Hill 3. It's going to be the most common recurring image in the entire game, outside of, like, the blood and rust stuff for aesthetics. For actual symbolism, the cyclic imagery through literal cycles and circles and cyclic behavior to um, an insect birth cycle, which we'll see referenced later, we're going to be seeing a lot of that. And I'll bookmark it as we go. We could discuss probably in day two, but most certainly in day three, what exactly that entails. So, let's start exploring. Well, a rabbit doll. No, it's a costume. Is there someone in there? It looks like there is, but I don't feel like making sure. That is Robbie the Rabbit making his debut. God, imagine dying on the way to take a shit. That's the bathroom over there. How embarrassing. So what we have over here are some bodies in cages. Now, these are all interesting. Because we're going to also, in, uh, in conjunction with the four circles we were talking about, three unique, uh, one larger, we have four cage units. And we have four bodies in cages. Uh, you can fall into the holes on hard. Yes, you can, and that's probably why I'm not going to do it. Because, haha, I don't want to embarrass myself on live. So, we have four cage, uh, four cages of four bodies in it. We have three that are going to look like this. So, what you see is, like, what appears to be, like, some sort of humanoid hanging by an arm. So, you can see an arm raising up, down to the shoulders. To the left, you have, the, like, his head... One arm slumped, and the rest of his body gone down. Let's examine. And what's this? Something strange inside a cagey box thing. A person? Not quite. I don't really want to stare at it for very long, whatever it is. What the? So one thing about Silent Hill 3 is that it really does elaborate and expand on what kind of uh, dialogue you get from examining objects. You will sometimes get multiple different uh, answers based on how many times you examine something. It's very unique to this game in particular, and I do appreciate it. Silent Hill 2 had brief moments of it, but this game really takes it to the front. Robbie's looking at me! What, Rick? You don't, uh... You don't, uh... You don't... You don't like that? You don't like him? He's your friend. We're friends to the end. But, so, in this cage as well, it's the hanging figure, but this one seems to have two arms up this time. As well as the one on the other end, that is, just for posterity's sake, we'll show it off. 
the one on this end is also the hanging man. But, when we get down here, this one's different. This one's bigger. This one seems to just be floating. Like, its arms are almost like crossed on its chest. Also seems to be a little darker, a little more rotted. Like this one's older. Let's continue. Now, before we keep going, there's something very interesting. So as you can see, Heather started with a little knife. So let's actually go into Heather's inventory, as that is our protagonist's name, Heather. Let's go into her inventory. So we got a flashlight, a radio, a knife, a steel pipe, a handgun, and a submachine gun. So I want you guys to put a mental bookmark for this. I did warn you about this, because this is going to come up much later in the game. Definitely tomorrow. These four weapons, specifically. And why Heather, at this point in the game, has to do with that. Uh, do you know what the Hanged Man means in Tarot? Um, I'll get into it in Day 3. There is a tarot thing, but it's le but I think it's like the thing with the tarot is that there is a tarot aspect to Silent Hill 3. It's a puzzle in the final dungeon, but the tarot aspect and the literal uh, symbolism of the tarot cards does not matter as much as what the cards mean in relation to the puzzle and the characters. But we'll get to that in day three. But these four weapons. I just want to really bookmark that. Because it leads to something that I... It's one of my biggest head scratches of this game. Because it's clearly deliberate. And it's clearly intentional. But I have no fucking clue what it means. Let's continue. Uh, yes, yeah, Silent 3 does them the most. Multiple dialogue stuff. I also feel that Heather has the most character and personality in the original trilogy. I think Heather has the most on-the-surface character. Like, Heather is, as a protagonist, she's much more expressive than Harry or James. For Harry, it makes sense, specifically uh, because Harry was, like, kind of an audience insert character. For James, it's because of his specific characterization leads him to be very reserved and quiet. Where he starts off as, like, an audience insert like Harry Mason... But the more you learn of him, the more you realize how distant and wrong James actually is as a person. Whereas Heather, as we're going to see going forward, she has a lot more, like, off-the-cuff personality. These, there are boxes of cookies and chocolates on display. I love this kind of stuff, but I don't feel like eating it here and now. It's a row of shirts for sale. I don't think they'd help me at all. But yeah, like, little things like that. Like, she has a little bit more spunk and personality than the past two characters, which is really fun. <laughs> the Eye of Night, my favorite tarot. Don't spoil it, Dave, but unironically, the Eye of Night is one of my favorite bits of tarot, is one of my favorite bits of puzzle symbolism in the game. It's actually, like, deviously clever. It's a rabbit stuffed animal. Uh, it's a rabbit stuffed animal here. The mouth part is stained red. Almost like blood stains. Disgusting. Oh, well, nothing here. Uh, music head tomboy. Hey, Doom Game Critic, been too long. How are you? Not too bad. I'm actually, uh, no, you know, it's, uh, it's been a rough, you know, been a little rough times, but we're doing a lot better. Things are looking up. Uh, I quite like Heather's personality. I really like Heather. Uh, she's a very fun protagonist, and I think a lot of, I really think, like, even though I do really like this, I think largely... A lot, the only, th I like Silent Hill 3 a lot as a game. I do think Silent Hill 3's sole bit of staying power is Heather as a character. You know, like, I love the game, but it doesn't have, like, the, the iconography of Silent Hill 2. And obviously Silent Hill 1 kind of invented this aesthetic. But, ah. as much as I love the game, Heather's, like, really the only thing that really stuck with people about Silent Hill 3. So, I do think it's a testament to the writing and characterization. That's fair, yeah. Uh, Heather's much more expressive. That's more fair to say 
Uh, I think she's a lot more fun compared to the other two. I agree. Like, I think Heather having more of this, like, fuck yeah, spunky attitude to things is a great contrast to really set this game apart. Uh, glad to hear that. I'm doing okay myself. Hell yeah. I love Heather. She's my favorite besides Harry and James. Uh, I definitely like Heather a lot more than Harry. God, this game's audio design is so fucking good. But yeah, I really enjoy Heather a lot more than Harry, because, like, Harry's just an audience insert. Let's get into it. Uh, it's outside of the fact that he's voiced by Symphony of the Night Dracula. Like, he's just kind of there. Uh, I remember a lot of the environments aren't as good as the other two. I I think this is easily the best-looking PS2 game. This is the best-looking game in the Silent Hill series. Visually, I still think this game is unmatched. My name's Harry Mason. I came here on a vacation. I'm looking for my daughter. My daughter. My d d d daughter I have no idea what you're talking about, Harry. <laughs> looking for my daughter. Fucking right on cue, hell yeah. Okay, so this is a silent cutscene, so I can't talk over this because we're gonna have a longer one soon. Uh so the roller coaster and specifically the railroad imagery here, where something on coming towards you. This is a recurring symbol we're going to see a lot in the game. As we see in this instance, Heather is on a single railroad going forward. Something's coming towards her, and it kills her. We're going to see this image going forward a lot. So, I'll discuss it more as, like when the big reveals and shit happened. Nightmare. Call sooner. Yeah, I guess I was. Anyway, I'm coming home now. Oh, I didn't get that thing you asked me to. Okay. <laughs> okay, I will. I love you too, Dad. Heather, I need to speak with you. My name is Douglas Carter. I'm a detective. A detective? Really? Well, nice talking to you. Hold on. There's someone that wants to meet you. Just let me have an hour. No half an hour of your time. My daddy always told me not to talk to strangers. This is very important. It's about your birth. I'm not interested. Are you still following me? Do I have to scream? Sorry. I'll wait here. Uh, 
Uh, no audio. Uh, no, it's like I'm just not talking during the cutscenes, unless it's like a cutscene where, like the roller coaster example we did before, I know that there's a lot to come in and I, I gotta like hammer something out real quick <laughs> in this game. Uh, before I read more of the comments, I just want to highlight one little thing. This is the first game in the series I really felt nailed the voice act. This is the one. This is the only one in the series. No, that's not true. Sino 4, actually, for all my problems with that game, has good voice act. But specifically Sound Hill 3, like just this conversation between two characters, there's no more of that kind of fanboy cope that I hate to say Silent Hill 2 had of they are act they sound weird and wrong on purpose. That's not it. Because in Silent Hill 2, the voice acting is not bad, it's just inconsistent. Where occasionally everyone, when they need to deliver their lines flawlessly, does it. You just get a lot of weird bullshit in between. Ex with the exception of Mary slash Maria's voice actress, who fucking nails it start to finish. Uh, but just this conversation between uh, Heather and Douglas here, immediately these just sound like actual people. Heather sounds like an actual teenage girl. Uh, Douglas sounds like an actual 50-something-year-old uh, chain smoker. Like, they sound like real people for the first time in the series. I don't know. I, I think that and it, as we go forward with uh, the two other very central characters, I really think this is the game where the, they nailed how to do Silent Hill voice acting. Uh, so let's start reading comments now, since people have uh, been going. Uh, Sticker Rick says, God, that lighting is so good. This game is fucking gorgeous. Uh, it actually makes me kind of frustrated going back to this one. Because when you go to Silent Hill 4 right after, they didn't even bother trying to have any sort of simulated dynamic lighting. They just, they just like, quit, I guess. I don't know. Uh, no Konami code doomed. Pack it up, boys. Stream's no longer worth watching. Listen, I'm doing it pure right now, okay? Uh, if there's a continuation of the third game, I would like to see a grown-up or older Heather in present times, like in her early 30s. We'll save it for the day three, when I'm doing, like, a little bit of a... Sort of like a follow-up video. Uh, not follow-up video. Like, just sort of like a last-minute, last thoughts on the whole trilogy and series uh, to end the streams on. But, while I do agree more with Dave that I just would rather have no more Silent Hill games, because I, I think 3, to me, is the perfect capstone, and they all just kind of went downhill afterwards... If they were to theoretically, in a perfect world, get the dream team of perfect uh, creators together to make a proper follow-up to this, there is a character in this game I do think should get a follow-up and be the protagonist, but we can only talk about that once all the spoilers are out of the way. So, I'll keep that in mind for day three, so stay tuned. Let's see. I'm in this game. Me and my trench coat. No, Dave's right. Like, you gotta see the Konami code version of his outfit, and then you can say if it's you. <laughs> uh, if Konami was trustworthy and made good games again, it would have been nice. Yeah, like, that's the thing. That is one of the true things. Like, Konami has just routinely proven, and especially in just the last year, has proven they have no clue what to do with this IP. They just fumbled the bag with it. And I think uh, Rick said this, like, a long time ago. But it holds true, like, Silent Hill might be the most fumbled IP of all time. I have never seen something with such brand recognition get routinely messed up, screwed up, and just have the ball dropped by its owner as Silent Hill. It's insane how badly they dropped the ball on this franchise. Uh, isn't Silent Hill 4 Homecoming? Silent Hill 4, Silent Hill 4 The Room... After the room, there was Silent Hill Origins, technically Silent Hill Zero, and then there was Silent Hill 5, which they backed down on that and just called it Silent Hill Homecoming. Uh, 
yeah, three is the end of the series. It does feel like an ending. To me, it, like, it really does feel like an end of the series. <laughs> Hit the lever! Now, anyway, let's talk about the game again. So, for that cutscene, the making of Silent Hill 3 describes the sunset opening there of Heather waking up from her nightmare as her unnaturally red. Like, they really point that out. And how it symbolizes something red is awaiting her. We'll talk about that a little more going on. Uh, there's a lot of different ways people have read that over the years. It's obviously up for interpretation, but we can, like, give a few as the game continues. Uh, but during the phone call with her dad, we get one little bit of characterization of Heather that... I don't know if it means much, but I think it's interesting. And there's a few more little bits of that going forward that I think are going to help. Heather has a shoddy memory. Oh, I forgot that thing you asked me to get. Haha. -ha. Heather doesn't have a great memory. I think that's a very interesting thing to immediately establish as her character. I don't think this game does quite as good a job as Silent Hill 2 did of giving you, in their first introduction, everything you need to know about a character. But I also think that's deliberately intentional for some characters like Douglas here. That weird old detective's out there, so I'm not leaving. So, her interactions with Douglas there also, as we've already just, uh, described, show off a little bit of just how much more expressive and dynamic a character Heather is. She talks back, she confronts. She's a little, there's a little bit more spice to Heather as a protagonist, whereas James is sort of passive and cowardly, where he's more of like for the first, like I said, for the first half of Silent Hill 2, James is more of an audience insert than anything else, which is intentional when you and on a replay you can start to see why, like, sort of the facade of James's character. But you know, we're just talking about two again. And also, I will say another thing. Uh oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. But I will say another thing that. The I will well the camera work of this isn't as good as two. I really do appreciate how that cutscene really shows off a voyeuristic kind of creep factor. It has that upshot through the vents. Like there's a very voyeuristic creep factor, and the fact that essentially this fifty-something-year-old man is cornering a teenage girl in a bathroom. She's not going out there. I will say this immediately sets a distinct tone for Heather's interactions with people going forward. And uh, maybe a tone for Douglas. Maybe not, though. We'll see. Uh, uh, there's one character who deserves to have a sequel. Doomed, please. No one wants to actually see Stanley. <laughs> oh, we'll fucking talk about Stanley. Uh, I can raise it to Heather not having a great memory. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, oh, that tiny little detail about Heather's memory. Yeah. It's a very tiny detail, but we're going to get a little more of that in a minute. Uh, I can't help but theorize that Henry of Silent Hill 4 was trying to be an audience insert character like James was, but wasn't nearly as strong or well done. James was interesting at times. James works as an audience insert because that's the flip. You're supposed to relate or insert yourself into James until you start to realize how broken and fucked James actually is as an individual. And then he becomes much more distant to you as the game continues. Henry in Silent Hill 4 is an audience insert. They even said in uh, Making Up, he's just supposed to be a player insert character. There is no uh, Henry Townsend. He's just, he's you. That's it. So everyone who makes those analysis of Silent Hill 4, how he's like, oh, secretly depressed and secretly an amazingly complicated character. It's, fuck, it's an absolute lie. It's an absolute cope. Word of God completely contradicts you. The director of Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 4, from the word from the word of God itself, said Henry Townsend is an audience insert character. I digress. This song is so good, this music is so good. But this is our save point. So what's really interesting about the save point here um, is... As we were talking about the teacup ride that opened the game, like the very first thing you saw, that's the save symbol. Three little circles on top of a bigger circle. It's the exact same thing. Interesting. That's like the mark on this mirror. It looks so familiar somehow. 
What do I know it from? Where did I once see it? And, and why does my head hurt so much when I try to remember it? Yeah, it's all right, my uh, New Game Plus bucket. There we go. Uh, not hating Henry, but he was weak in comparison. That's fair. I, I hate Henry. I'm a certified Henry hater over here. Uh, isn't there another certain RPG Maker game we love that I can't shut the fuck up about with the player insert flip as well? Hmm. I have... I don't know if, we're, if I want to hear about it. No Mori. Ah. Once in a generation comedic talent made in a lab. I am fucking hilarious. <laughs> Pun master. Let's go. Uh, it is worth noting that Silent 3 save symbol is also the most easy. Uh, is it worth noting? It is worth noting. Uh, you actually do get an explanation to what the symbolism of the save symbol is later. So you do get that. But it also, uh, the fact that she's trying to remember it, it shows the the fact that Heather has a bad memory. And that seems intentional. Let's examine them. I don't like mirrors. It's almost like there's an unknown world right on the other side. And the person staring at me isn't really me. Just an imitator. I know how stupid that sounds, but that's how I feel. But if I keep thinking about it, it just makes me feel sick. Heather doesn't like mirrors. We'll get more of that going forward, too. Uh, you are right, uh, Music Head Tomboy, but they also have more of an explanation in a, hit, in a note that a lot of people miss. So we'll do our level best to find it. Guess someone's in there. Let's think about the optics of this for a second, though. A 50-year-old man cornered a teenage girl in the bathroom, and she feels safe escaping out of the bathroom window. <laughs> like, let's think about the optics of this for a minute. <gasps> that makes sense. Uh, but yeah. Let's examine this. Well, that's helpful. Maybe I should walk around it. Nah, never mind. But how did this car park here? So that a little, well, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we'll talk about that actually very shortly. Of uh, A little character detail about Heather that I think informs the ending. At least my reading on it. Oh, she's tired. If you examine that door again, Heather says, kind of rude to keep knocking, huh? I didn't know that. Actually, that's very cool. I didn't know that that happened. But that does, the, the little stall there does lead to something cool later on. And I almost forgot, we haven't examined Heather's inventory. It's a switchblade for self-defense. I've never used it, but just in case. No supplies, but we do have two items. House key. It's for my front door. Daisy Villa Apartment 102 is carved into the key. Dad gave this pendant to me on my birthday. It's one of my treasured belongings. So between this and the payphone call with her father, I think it's fair to say that Heather and her dad have a pretty good relationship going on. Very cute. Very wholesome. Let's examine the pendant. There's a jewel inside. Like a little red tablet. When I asked Dad what it was, he said, just a lucky charm. But when he told me to take, but then he told me to take good care of it and never take it off. I'm gonna keep examining this throughout the game. It doesn't change, but I do want to hammer in this as an important item. It's interesting, but you know, <laughs> I'm gonna put my address on this key so if I lose it, they can break it. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Heather is not bright. She's uh, she's not necessarily the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. But we love her for it. The ambient audio in this game is so fucking strong. 
I think just from a technical standpoint, Silent Hill 3, without question, is the best game in the series. 